Well, last week we discussed the resurrection. Any questions in regards to the resurrection? I mean, I had difficulty in the study because I just, if, if you don't accept Jesus Christ that he's, the, he's God the Son, then you're saying God didn't die on the cross for you. And all throughout Scripture we see that it is God himself um, of course, in human form, being Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, that died on the cross for our sin. Um, if you get past that from the perspective of the belief of the Jehovah's Witness, everything is right intact. They, they believe right along Scripture. I mean, from, from no forgiveness of sin without the shed blood, uh, we examine the shedding of blood, we examine the perspective of what God designed from the perspective of Old Testament, all the way through to the um, crucifixion of Christ. And, but I just have a difficult time. Um, I can't get over that, the perspective that they don't believe Jesus is God. Um, and so, but uh, any questions in regards to what we discussed last week of the resurrection? Well, if not, we'll jump into tonight's study. Um, continuing along, um, uh, we're going to find out some things from the perspective where, uh, sorry to say, but the authority that is within the church from the Jehovah's Witness, some of you have already shared experiences, thoughts, comments of friends that you have that are, uh, that are um, within the religion of the Jehovah's Witness, and you've shared that they've said they've been excommunicated or, or circumstances like that, and the authority that the local church has within individual lives. Um, if you would go back and study Scripture, uh, beginning especially, I found it very prevalent in Acts chapter 6, is where the church is assembling, and there's some... There's some skirmish. There's some things that are happening within the church that the apostles cannot uh, get to and take care of. Um, the apostles claim there in, in Acts chapter six that they were set aside. Their responsibility was for preaching, was for nourishing, and the needs of individuals would uh, be assigned to those that they would select. And if you know, this is where the seven are chosen to serve alongside the apostles. This is where the basis of individuals serving in a church alongside the pastor, um, taking care of the perspective of the business in the needs of the people while the pastor would be set aside from the perspective of study uh, for the perspective of preaching and teaching the word of God. We find that in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 sets the tone of the forming in the scene and the examples that the church had in individuals' lives as far as meeting the needs and the distribution of certain things. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 6. Let's read the first uh, few verses. It's only through verse 7, and then Stephen goes on his way and gets accused. But uh, in, in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying. The disciples are who? Not the apostles. This is disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. Okay, was multiplying. There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned. There's the twelve. There's the apostles, not referring to the word disciples earlier. But the twelve summoned the multitude of disciples and said... It's not desirable that disciple, or it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from them among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip. Uh, Prochorus, uh, Nicanor, Timion, and Paramentheus, and Nicholas, a, a proselyte, 
from Antioch, who they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So we see the ministry of the church really beginning to grow here, and the apostles appointed more men to help serve the local congregation and to distribute the needs of the people. When the local church was established here in Acts, how did they receive uh, or how did they fund the needs of the people? What, what, what do you know about the local church in the book of Acts? When there was a need, what did the people do? Well, somebody had a need. They came to the church. How did the church meet that need? Okay, somebody comes and they need a new roof on their house. Well, the apostles. Yeah. Mm hmm. Took care of up until the time when they became large. But how did they take care of it? I mean, what gave them the authorities from the perspective to handle the needs of the people in the church? Where did they get their abilities and, and monies and, and authority to move forward and handle those things? See, what's happened is, over time, in the beginning of the church, what did they do when there was a need? People came and sold stuff of their own and did what with the monies for it? Brought it to the church to meet the needs of the people. When there were needs there, the, the, everybody within the church would step up to make sure that the needs of the people were met. Is that still the way it is today? We, we've taken a turn from the perspective in, and really in the church has done this. The church normally takes and points individuals, i.e. whatever, somebody's house catches on fire and needs a new roof. They didn't have insurance. But what's the first, what's the first statement of the church when somebody knows in the church that they need a new roof? Well, what would be the first comment? Well, don't they have insurance? Why would the church say that? Early church didn't say that. But what do we do? We throw it back to the world to let the world take care of the needs of the believer. And it's really, really unfortunate because most even today it's that way. Individuals come with needs to the church and what does the church do in that perspective? Well, can't you get assistance from the state of Michigan? Can't you get all these other things before the church helps? What's that doing? It's taking it and throwing it back to the world to help. And then when the world can't, the church will come in and fill in. And we see throughout Acts that that's not the way that the church was designed by God. That wasn't the intention of the church. But within that same perspective, we're talking about the aid. We got to talk about the authority that the church had in one's life. Um, and we have to examine from the perspective of why the church had such a great authority in individuals' lives. There was a statement that I found um, on, this is a Jehovah's Witness document that I'm reading and I'm studying through uh, with you. And I got to tell you, I'm in. 100% agreement of this entire nine-page document on church authority on how they believe and how they go about addressing things. But they make a statement here that God's fatherly discipline, which can affect our spiritual lives, can take many forms. One is his arrangement to exclude from the Christian congregation a person who no longer wants to live by God's standards, or who refuses to do so. 
Now, if you heard that, what is one way that the authority had, or the church had, has authority in, in regards to a member's life? Living and examining that they live by God's standards, or obviously we're talking about the authority of the church, one who refuses to do so. Now, some of you, like I said, have friends in the Jehovah's Witness. What happens in the Jehovah's Witness church if you're caught smoking? And everyone knows why you're sitting there. What if you're caught drinking? Same thing. Anything that they consider to be a sin against God in the perspective of, of uh, leavens the lump, if I can put it that way, those are Paul's words in Corinthians, that one sin within the church brings leaven to the whole lump, is what Paul says. So here, from a Jehovah's Witness perspective, when sin is publicly known, they deal with it, and the one that is sitting back there, it's known. It's an impact to that individual's life or life. What have we done to minimize that impact? I mean, the one thing that the Jehovah's Witness do, and we'll look at Matthew chapter 18, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, is they take these right to the core in its church knowledge and discipline now, not from a perspective, it's not supposed to be a gossip session or whatever else, but what, in that perspective, that authority comes, that one that would come in and receive that discipline from the church to be separated, now I don't agree with the back pew, but separated from God's people, what does that person have to agree to to let that happen? They have to agree with that church, and that church has to be a vital part of their life. Because if it's not, well, hey, you know, what, you, what you're doing is wrong, this, that, whatever, not willing to repent, you know, your discipline is, is, you know, like I said, I don't agree with the back pew setting, but the authority that the church, that one would come to church next Sunday, and would sit in that, I'm going to use that pew right there, would sit in that pew, and what would we all do? I mean, it, it, it's a shaming thing, honestly, is it not? When you walked in and I'm sitting there, what are all you going to do? You, you know why I'm sitting there, and you're going to walk. And we'll look at what Scripture says from the perspective of disfellowshipping with one that's not willing to repent, change, and stop in their way of sin. It, and it is, it is. That is the disfellowshipping perspective and the authority that God has given to the church. Now, we're going to get a little bit ahead of ourselves, but what does the disfellowshipping of the church and the authority that the church has in one's life to say, look, if you're not willing to change your ways and please God with your life, please stop attending until you're willing to do that. Now, what does that disfellowshipping represent? It, it is, it's, it's much, much greater than shunning. What did the children of Israel do in many of the sins that were referred to in the day, and a lot of the sin that was amongst the children of Israel was, was sexually related, and we'll look at it in Leviticus, what was the result of that if you were caught in such a sin? Oh, no, 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 no. You're dead. You're killed. Yeah, it's stoning, however, whatever it was, you were... so. That disfellowshipping in the New Testament that we'll look at Matthew chapter 18 and the authority that comes to the church to be able to set one aside to do that is the same perspective from the Old Testament because if you were caught in that sin and unrepentant of it, well, in the Old Testament, it wasn't even unrepentant. 
if you were caught from it, period, you were killed, you were put to death. And so how do you fellowship with someone that's put to death? They're dead. How do you fellowship with them? You can't. And that's the exact representation that comes into the New Testament with that perspective of disfellowshipping. It's the example that we see that the children of Israel did and that God gave them instruction to do it from that perspective. So when we look at the authority of the church in one's life, does the church provide spiritual protection to its members? Does the church provide spiritual protection to its members? I'm gonna. I'll. I'll use. I'll use us, Leonard Community Church. You being a member or a participant here of Leonard Community Church, do you receive any spiritual protection from being part of Leonard Community Church? Had it just had it had a comment about it on our way into church, and and the individual that we were communicating with doesn't even know our study, but it fit it right to a T. Okay, that's and that's perfectly okay. And and what when when we're saying protection, we have to separate what is in our mind of physical protection versus spiritual protection. Okay, what aspect does the church have to influence your life spiritually in both a positive and negative way? That is correct, but you won't receive the protection that I'm, I mean, the things that I'm sharing you won't receive from another church until you become a member of them. Okay? <clears throat> it was, a comment was made, and I'll just help you just to, so we can stay on track. A comment was made tonight that there is no way we know that we would have gotten as far as we have without the prayers of Leonard Community Church. And what I'm talking about is we are talking with Dolores and just the challenges that they've been going through and everything else. And Dolores was just like, boy, we really, because Anita asked her, well, how can we continue to pray for you? And Dolores was like, you know, I got to tell you, there is no way that I know we could have gotten a, as far along as we have without the prayers of the church. And her, her expression was to make sure that we thank the church for their prayers. Now, this is a member, obviously. I mean, shut in. We understand the circumstances. And that is that spiritual protection that I am talking about. If you're not a part of Leonard Community Church, now, when I say not a part, I'm not talking about a relative that we pray for because it's important to the members. But if you're not part of a fellowship within a called-out body of believers, how are you prayed for and cared for from a spiritual perspective? You're not. You, you Zero. And that is the same thing that we'll see when Paul disfellowships. It, it uses some very, very direct words that he turned them over to Satan. And everybody's like, oh, well, they're going to hell then. No. He pulled them away from the protection of the church. The church no longer prayed for that individual except for them to have a repentive spirit. Okay, we always will pray that. Always. And as I share all this, we have to kind of stay on track of it all. What happens today when a church would try to exercise such authority in one's life? Why? It's, it's easier over there. I don't have to face what you're saying because what doesn't this church do with that church? Fellowship and talk. There is a perspective even, it's, it's one thing that the Baptist church used to do very, very well 
and they were criticized for it. But yet, following Scripture, they were right on target. The Jehovah's Witness do this between the kingdom halls. You can't be at this kingdom hall up here in Oxford and go to the kingdom hall in Clarkston because you were in discipline there. Guess what the kingdom hall in, according to the website, in there, guess what the kingdom hall in Clarkston is going to tell you? The higher authority that is there. When you walk in, who are you? You get, you know what? You don't belong here. You belong with them. How do you know? Because the local areas of the leaders of the church communicate that Dan Wells is on church discipline for whatever. He's a drunkard. He's on church discipline for it. I want you to be aware. Why? Because it's easier for me to drive to Clarkston and avoid the whole problem in Oxford until what? Time passes, brushes under the carpet, and time passes and things are, well, it's not really that bad. But when I arrive in Clarkston, the leader there in Clarkston, because they don't call their uh, ministers preachers, but the leader there in Clarkston goes, you're not welcome here. Until you resolve your problem with Oxford. Now, what has happened with that over the years? Don't do it. Don't. It doesn't happen. And if it does happen, what do the people do? Today, in today's society, you just quit going to church. Okay, I don't have that authority in my life. The question that I have for you is then, within the local church, are we, from what I just read, this is like I said, the statement, God's fatherly discipline, which can affect our spiritual lives, can take many forms. One of his arrangements is to exclude from the Christian congregation a person, and this is the key, you have to hear this. Is this important to you in your life, this very next statement? A person who wants to live by God's standards. That is the key. If I don't care to, to live a life that pleases God, why am I going to care what the church says? Number one, I don't. Why do I care what the local church says? Don't care what they say. Now, the perspective where a lot of things gets this out of hand is the local church is an authoritative figure in an individual's lives, but not to sit there and put people under a microscope. That is what, I'll say it again, that is a lot what the Baptist church did. You went to a movie. This is, this is in the 60s, 70s time frame, and maybe 80s. Don't, don't, you went to a movie, all right? What are you doing going to a movie? Going to watch it. Well, you know, I mean, I had a grandmother that was wholehearted, 100% Baptist from every little bit of blood that th flowed through her body. And when I, as a grandchild, as a teenager, she would find out that I went to a movie theater, whoo, I wouldn't hear it, but my mom would. All about it. What's this Carrie told me Daniel was at a movie? Oh, the whole deal. Well, all the thoughts of the things that happen at movie theaters, nothing but a sinful place, everything else. Now, church discipline, authority of the church, the church it's not the church's responsibility to put your life under a microscope. That's what a lot of people begin to feel. A church has the authority? You mean they can put my life under a microscope? No, church authority and discipline and spiritual protection and guidance from the local church is all done from what we say is a public perspective. Okay? I have a challenge right now of something that I'll say. In my own life, I have a daughter that if she was a member of this church, should be under church discipline. Why would that be? I have one. She should be. 
She's not a member of this church, so this church does not have any authority. She's, she's not a member of any church. But if she was and was not willing to correct the circumstance that is public knowledge, what should the church do? And I'll, I mean, I'll just say it. She's living with a man that she's not married to. What is that? The Bible calls it sin. And it's publicly known. It's, it's really, I mean, who doesn't know? Everybody knows. And what does the church do with that? What should we do with it? Well, that's the problem. Because if an individual doesn't have a desire to live by God's standards, when they're approached from a perspective in their life of not living by God's standards, and they don't care about them, do you see where the authority breaks down? None. All because of the statement that one does not care to live and please God with their life. And what has society done from the authority of the local church? Just quit. Why, why even go? And see, when one is truly taken out from the perspective of the spiritual care of the local church, it impacts their lives. If they have a desire to please God. Now, that's where we get into another perspective. And we're going to look at, we're going to look at, I mean, we got to have our Bibles because there's a ton of scripture on all this. We're going to look at that perspective that what gives the individual a desire to please God? Why do we have a desire to please God? I mean, I have a great desire. Do I fail at it? Just because I have a desire doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect in doing it. Okay? But I have a desire to want to please God. And having that desire is the thing that I want to live my life according to God's standards and not mine. And if I am wrong in a standard of what I'm, how I'm publicly living my life, who is the correct it? Who does God give the responsibility to do to correct that? Well, first, to a brother or sister in Christ that knows it is supposed to step up privately and correct it with them or make them knowledgeable of what they're participating in is not pleasing to God, then maybe the individual goes, I don't care. Whoa. Okay. Then where does it go? Then it would go to a second individual as a witness that would come of, yes, that if it's ever needed, yes, that person was presented with how they were living their life was not pleasing to God. And that second person is not there to be a side taker or a judge. They are there as a witness that that individual was presented with information from Scripture in how they're publicly living their life that it's not pleasing to God. Then, still not willing to change it, then it goes to the church, and when it comes to the church... That's where the witness goes, yes, I was present. They refused to repent and change. And then the church comes in, and the perspective of church discipline is disfellowshipping them from that local body and taking them out of the spiritual care of the church, where the church no longer prays for them, the church no longer cares for their needs that they may have, that the, however the church could offer assistance. And the only thing that the church does is pray for their spiritual repentance. That's it. We don't pray because you're sick. We don't pray for healing for you. We don't pray because you're going to a surgery. No. The only thing, if you examine Scripture, the only thing we're praying for is that God grabs your heart and you respond in a spiritual repentant way. And then we look at restoration. And how is one restored? They come back to the church. They admit they were wrong in their sin ask for forgiveness, 
what is the church expected to do? Forgive without question, and in that forgiveness, restoration. Now, through that restoration, there is study in Scripture and, and everything else. It's not just you walk through the door, hey, I'm restored, you forgave me. You are, you're welcomed back, but there is time invested in growing one that has uh, strayed away. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11. Yes, ma'am. In today's society, it is, it is very, very difficult, okay? Because one that will receive church discipline is one that cares that their life is pleasing to God, okay? Those are the only people that will receive church discipline, is... I care that my life is pleasing to God, okay? So when it would come into that perspective, I mean, how I would handle it is if it came to the church, I would approach the individual. I don't care. Dan, I'm not, I don't care. Throw me out. Go ahead. Well, the church has to do that. I don't do that. The church does that. I don't. But then how it would be handled from me would be, just if I can use you, Judy, it's your question, okay? But fine, I'm, I'm just going to go to Romeo Christian Society then. And I catch wind that you're attending Romeo Christian Society. I would contact you directly and say, Judy, I want you to know I understand that you're attending Romeo Christian Society. I made that name up, but and that's where you're attending. yes. I will be meeting with the pastor this week in regards to the discipline of Leonard Community Church because they need to be aware of it. You shouldn't be participating with them as a local cult. Have you informed them that you were under church discipline from Leonard? Well, yes, I have. Wow, that's strange that they didn't contact me. But I will be meeting with them to let them know that you're under church discipline. That's what the kingdom halls do in the ministers thereof, is they make sure that the locals, I don't know, there's not a, didn't find five miles, nothing like, but the locals are aware that that individual is under church discipline. Because what we'll examine, what Paul says, is sin going from one, unrepentant sin from one church to another, does what? It corrupts the whole body. Okay? So does that answer your question of how do you do it? No, I get that. I understand how you would do it. Right. But, you know, the, you know, the, do you really do it? Well, that's, that's what's happened. Do churches really do it? Yeah. And the answer, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. and, and as we look at the perspective in the answer being no, and I'll say this out loud as a participant and as a believer that we should, why has the church lost their authority in people's lives? Because what don't we do? And the problem is church discipline doesn't remain church discipline the way it's to be instituted in Scripture. Church discipline turns into that back pew, that shaming, and then from there, it turns out Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is nothing but a big gossip session of Dan was drunk and everything else, and church discipline turns into church gossip. And once it turns into church gossip, there's no discipline about it whatsoever. Okay, And that's, that's where Paul again warns us, what is gossip? Those who go chatter about it publicly is gossip. What should be done to them? Galatians chapter 6 tells us to restore a brother in fault and be careful in the restoration lest ye may fall. What is, what is, what is he saying 
in my restoration, in the church's restoration to one that is in sin, I am to have a heart of restoration. And if I get caught gossiping, what has happened to me? Paul uses the words, I have fallen. That's where he says, lest ye may fall. Because the discipline has no longer been a focus of discipline, but a focus of gossip to say, oh, look what Pastor, look, look what Dan has done, blah, 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 blah. I would have never done that or whatever else. It turns into gossip and the very individual that was involved with the church discipline has fallen into sin itself that is trying to be corrected. And unfortunately, in today's society, Christians are one of the worst ones to kick their wounded. We're the first ones to do it. We'll gossip about a, a believer that's struggling with sin when really, should we be gossiping about them? What should we be doing? If you really care enough to talk about a believer that's struggling in sin, who should you be talking to? Them. You shouldn't be talking to me. You shouldn't be talking to uh, 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 Joe, Kathy, Peter, Fred. You should be talking to them. That's how you show them you care. So the problem is, it all boils down to this statement that the authority of the church really is given to the church by the individual in their lives because they have a standard that has been set that they have a desire to please God. If you don't have a desire to please God, there is no church discipline from a human perspective that can impact you. It, it just won't. You don't care. But like, I, like this says, and I agree with it, this is one way that God uses to restore his children back to what we call righteous living. And when I say back, restore back to righteous living, we're not talking perfection that we don't sin or anything like that. We are talking that we've been advised of the sin that we're participating is public and it's taking the name of Christ through the mud in society and are you aware and do you care? Well, no. Dad, I'll use my own situation. No, I don't. I would rather live with my boyfriend. Okay? As a church member, now you've given me a responsibility that I have to follow through with. And even though it's my daughter, it has to be followed through with if she would be a member at a church. But it has to be the perspective first. The individual has to have the desire to please God. That's where the authority comes from. It really comes from, in my case, the authority of this church to discipline me would come from me because I have a desire to want to live my life pleasing to God, and I'm not, and the church is bringing it to correct me. And I have a heartfelt belief that spiritual care of the church comes through prayer, care, everything else. When that's removed from my life, I don't have people praying for me anymore. I believe in the power of prayer. But if I don't, the, the human aspect of church discipline can never work in a person's life. So, I mean, to ask you, you have to allow it. Or you just walk away from the church and don't go back. But as a true believer, you will find yourself very, very lonely. I, I truly believe that with all my heart. God doesn't turn his back on you, but you will find yourself very, very lonely. No fellowship from the church that you knew. All these things. It's like, man, I'm lonely. Well, as I, as I just preached for the last several weeks, what does the absence of God do in your life? What is it? It's misery. It's pain. It's suffering. And the absence of the church in your life would be what? Not the total absence of God, but God uses the church as the institution to keep us to live righteous lives. And if we don't care about that, then do we really care about the standards that God has? So, did you turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11? This is really a key point in authority from the church. And the authority from the church really comes into 
unfortunately, it is, you don't see a lot of authority from the church except from a disciplined perspective. That's where you really see the authority from the church in one's life. But remove the prayer from the church, remove the spiritual protection from the church, and the, the believer finds himself to be very, very lonely. But Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 11, is a key perspective. It says, and, and we should read all of from 12, 3 on through 11, but here in verse 11 it says, Now no chastening seems to be what? What's your Bible say? What's that? Okay, no discipline, that's fine, but seems to be what? Pleasant, or mine is joyful. No, no, no discipline is present or joyful when it happens. Um, the writer of Hebrews, if you would read from verse 3 on, refers to our human, our, our human father and our discipline that came from our hum, human father. All right? When I was given a whooping as a kid, was it pleasant when I was getting a whooping? No, it wasn't joyful. We all know that. It was painful. It was correction. But as today, I look back on the discipline of my dad, and Father's Day just came, and God tugged at my heart to thank my dad for not quitting. I want to ask you as a parent, is it easier to quit on your child in the time that they need discipline, or is it easier to discipline? Which one is easier? To quit. Don't discipline. Who cares? It is easier to quit. And this Father's Day, I wrote my dad an email, and I thanked him because an individual, I think, I, I don't know if I shared it or not, an individual came across Facebook, and it was a, it was a friend of mine that his parents quit. They didn't care. He could do anything he wanted. Anything. He could ride his motorcycle down the middle of the road. I mean, this was when we were this high. Okay, I mean, who cares? At 18, somebody's riding their motorcycle. But as a six-year-old boy that had to keep his motorcycle in the yard and not on the road, and yet I watch my friends race up and down the road, what do I want to do? I want to go race up and down. Mom and Dad, you don't belong in the road. So anyways, but just as he come across Facebook, and it was just, it just hit me. He ended up in prison because he was strung out on drugs and shot to murder police officers that pulled him over. Why? I can go all the way back. I know him. I mean, hung out with him often. Knew his mom and dad very, very well. Spent a lot of time with at him at his home. And I could go back and go, when you needed discipline in school and you got kicked out of school because you didn't care if he didn't like how you looked, he wanted to fight you. I mean, literally beat you up. I mean, talk about a bully. And I'm not, I'm not proud of the fact that I hung out a lot with him. But I looked at this and go, man, just, I mean, I remember this one kid named Bernie showed up as a new kid. Had the side of his head shaved and a comb over with his hair. A style of the time. Well, my friend didn't like that. There was nothing wrong except his... What do you want to do? So at the bus stop, getting on the bus one night from school, he picks a fight with him and gets kicked out of school. Now, if that was me, I might as well stay at school. I'm safer at school than I am going home if I get kicked out of school. In this case, nothing even happened. Mom and dad didn't do anything. They stayed working and everything else. And he's at home for the five days he's kicked out of school enjoying life, really. I don't have to go to school, whatever. Didn't care about his grades. But just an example of it's easier to quit as a parent than it is to follow through through discipline. And, and going along with what this portion of Scripture says, in the time of discipline, or no chastising seems to be joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless. Afterward, it what? This is God's word that says this. Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. This, I'm not making this up. You guys read it for yourself. What does God's word say? It's not joyous to be disciplined. 
It's painful for the time being. But what does the discipline in the pain produce? Peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What is discipline going to produce? It's going to produce, God has given up, I mean, short of thus saith the Lord, God says it's going to produce peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And as I said, if you would read through from the beginning of chapter 12, you will see the reference to your um, human parents referring to that whooping of how it hurt, being grounded, being disciplined, things taken away. However you were disciplined, it was for the purpose of producing a peaceable fruit. That's why. In God's discipline, is it any different? Think of the perspective of an individual living in sin and a loving brother or sister in Christ come alongside to see them restored and taken out of that sin. It's painful in the process. In the same thing, as we look to our human parents, mom and dad, we can equate them, of course, number one, with God and our Heavenly Father, but I challenge us as I look at this, what is it easier for a brother or sister in Christ to do when they find another brother or sister in Christ in sin? I have been faced with this personally many, many times. Turn your head and walk away. Let it go. Let it go. I, I, I don't want to get involved. I can give you all the reasons. And one, one perspective is some people know this individual, so I'm not going to share a name. One perspective is I confronted an individual caught red-handed from a perspective of participating in sin. And it affected my family. Now what do I do? I don't want to go talk to them. Well, I couldn't help it. God didn't let me off the hook. I had to go and talk with them. Very difficult. I did it. Didn't change their way. Reached out to a friend of both of ours and asked them to come participate. And I was told no. Why am I involved? And I said, I'm involved because... They're a brother in Christ, and what they're doing is publicly wrong, and it's dragging the name of Christ through the mud. What are we to do? It's affected my family directly, and they won't turn from it. Well, no. And this was a struggle within, within our church at the time, and so I didn't know what to do. And the individual friend of mine that I asked to participate with me was a deacon also. And so I didn't know what to do. I brought it up in a meeting and said, well, what do we do with this situation? I was amazed at the response of people that I had great respect for in what I'll say the faith wanted to turn their head rather than face the challenge. And I was full Lord. And I was told not to worry about it. It would work out. Yeah, it worked out all right. Worked out right smack into a, what I would call an unblessed wedding that they participated in and then shortly after ended up in a number divorce. And yet all because... I feel 100% I'm partially responsible because I allowed church leadership to turn their back on this individual. And I will never let that happen again. Never. And I see, I talk to the individual often, 
and everything else, and it's just, it's an absolute disaster that's not pleasing to God. And so, church discipline, discipline period, and the authoritative figure in an individual's life is never easy. It's never, it's never joyous. It's never, yes, I get to do this. Yes, I get, no. It's not a joyous thing to do. But when it's done, what promise does God give to us? That it will bring peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And I know for a fact the situation I'm sharing with you, the individual was trained by it. They would have responded. I, am, I feel, I know it. I know it because the impact in their lives and in, in the importance that God was to them, they would have responded if we would have followed through. But anyway, so we see that God gives us this from that perspective. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 20. Like I said, a lot of this in the authority of the church in our lives, we have to give that authority to the church. But God asks us through Scripture to make sure that we give that authority to the church and we would comply with that. Um, I want to get to Leviticus where we talked about, just so you don't leave without that reference. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 in verse 20. This is a turnover of a situation that I shared with you. I wanted to turn here so you had the reference of when I said Paul delivers them to Satan. If you read with me in the beginning, well, back up to verse 19. Uh, well, we got to go all the way back to 18. Paul writes to Timothy and says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected, okay, um, and I'm not drawing this out to you, Judy, but this is where he's referring to ones that I don't care what the church says. I don't need to have a good conscience before the church. Okay, that's what Paul is writing here to Timothy. Okay, so keep that in context of one not caring about having that wage of good warfare and having faith and a good conscience within the church. Okay, keep that thought in mind as we read this. Which, have, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered a shipwreck, a disaster in their lives of sin, of whom are, and he names them, Hymenaeus uh, and Alexander. And we'll refer back to them next week or the week following because they're an example that Paul uses elsewhere in Scripture. But here in Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that what? they may learn not to blaspheme. So these individuals we're going we're gonna to see here, they're accused of blaspheming the name of Christ publicly. But yet, what is their response? They rejected, which some having rejected, concerning that they would have a good warfare, or welfare and conscience within the church. Who cares? What am I going to do? I'm going to continue to blaspheme the name of Christ. They've rejected wanting that um, conscience before the church, a good conscience. So what does Paul say he does? He removes them and turns them over to Satan so they will stop doing what they're doing. What, is, what does that mean? Paul has disfellowshipped, um, i got to look at the name all the time to pronounce it, Hymenaeus and Alexander from the church, they're disfellowshipped, they're no longer prayed for, they're no longer cared for, they have needs in their lives, they're no longer met by the church. The only thing the church is doing at this point in time is praying for spiritual repentance. Because when they spiritually repent, what's the responsibility of the church? To accept them in and to forgive them and to restore them to fellowship. And so here is the example that Paul says, you know what, they won't, they don't care about the authority of the church in their lives and won't stop, turn them over to Satan. Turn them over to the world, 
Let the world have their way with them. That doesn't mean Paul does not have the authority to write this and say they've lost their salvation. They're going to hell. That's, so many people see this when Paul says, I delivered them to Satan. means Paul somewhere had the authority to go, you're, no, you're, no longer, you're unsaved. You're going to hell. That's not what that says. But they are disfellowshipped from the church and turned to the way of the world. And then God will use his other ways that we know are within Scripture through the Holy Spirit and bring them as we as a church, as there as a church here, prayed for that spiritual repentance. But this is exactly, Judy, what you ask, someone that doesn't care. What does the church have except you're not welcome here? Well, I want to worship. You can't worship with us until you're willing to make your sin right. That, that, and that, that becomes difficult because ran into that challenge in my life that one was, well, what are you going to do to me? I'm going to sit right there in that pew. What are you going to do, throw me out? It was, it was a real, real battle. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's what do you do? But you have to, as a church, exercise that authority. The church exercised that authority through church discipline, through the vote of the church, and the, the worst thing was we had to involve the local police to have them removed. It was horrible. It was just, ugh, why? Well, they wanted to make sure that they made a scene. And this is the exact purpose. They didn't care at that point in time. I'm so glad in this circumstance that I'm referring to that God did get a hold of their heart. They did repent. They have changed they do care. They did care. It's just they were in a rebellious state to go, if you want to do it, I'm going to make a scene so everybody knows. It wasn't beneficial for them at all. And I mean, they didn't get arrested or anything else, but the police came and chatted with the police out under the awning. They came in, pointed out. And they got up and walked out. And they, they said, this is church property. These people have the authority. It's their property. You're a member not in good standing. They've asked you to remove yourself from the property. Please do it. Or we will consider you trespassing. And they went on their way. But it was just an embarrassing perspective that the police had to be involved in that. But this is one of those perspectives. Turn them over to Satan. They're not welcome to worship or participate in that local body of believers. And if the church would stay unified together... That would that individual be welcomed in any other church to worship and participate? What would they be told? Go back to Leonard. And I'm just using us. Go back to Leonard and get your situation resolved there. And if you still feel led to come and worship with us, then please come. And that should be our response. That if someone that we knew was in a circumstance of such and they came to worship with us, we turn them back to their local church, but we turn them back after your resolve there and it's handled and you want to come worship with us, please do. That's the restoration and the joy to one that's restored. Really quick, just so you have your reference, turn back to Leviticus chapter 20. All the way back to... Third page, I think. Yeah, Leviticus chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 10. You can write down numbers 15, 30, and 31 to support it. But Genesis, Exodus, I can't even say it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Third book, Leviticus chapter 20. This is where we see the example of the disfellowshipping and what it, what it truly is intended to mean. Uh, we'll pick up in verse 10. I um, encourage you to look at the other penalties that are involved to one um, in regards to sinning, publicly sinning against God and the information is known. In verse 10 of Levit Leviticus chapter 20, it says, The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer 
and the adulteress shall surely be put to, what does your Bible say? You're dead. There's no, you are disfellowshipped. There's no fellowshipping with the dead. The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to, uh, and then their blood shall be upon them. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to this permanent separation. They have committed perversion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man lies with a male and he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to their blood shall be upon them. If a man marries a woman and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burned with fire. And both he and they and there may be no wickedness among you. Of course, what is the result of being burned with fire? You die. If a man mates with an animal, it shall be surely put to death. And also shall kill the, kill the animal. Same thing if a woman, it goes on to say. If a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, and his mother's daughter, and sees her nakedness, and she sees his, it is wicked as a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. Now, this is different. It has changed. Being cut off is not the same perspective that we look at in the New Testament of being disfellowshipped. The perspective of being disfellowshipped in the New Testament is you don't fellowship with the dead. It's as they don't exist unless they come for restoration, okay? Because this is Old Testament law. We don't put people to death for sin. But it changes if a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter and sees her nakedness and she sees his. It is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. Now, this is, Kathy, what you just mentioned. They're, they're shunned and taken out of the tribe. They're no longer welcome within the family. On your own. See ya. But they're not put to death. But they are separated from the family. Okay, that's what that means to be cut off from. They're not put to death, but they're separated. This is the picture that we have as we go into the New Testament and examine the authority of the church and the church disfellowshipping someone is the exact same perspective of one being put to death for their sin. There's no longer any participation with them. That really kind of brings into the reality of how severe God looks at sin publicly within the church. He look, and, and this is where, like I said, as we started this in the authority of the church, we've lost our way as a church. And I'm talking the church of this day and age. Nobody respects, very few people respect the authority of a church. To come into it and say, hey, well, you shouldn't be doing that. Huh? Don't worship with, well, I won't worship with you. I'm going to go over there. You know, then the pastor should have the responsibility to do the unwanted thing and the, all right, if you're worshiping there, Hey, I'm meeting with you because Dan came over here and he's under church discipline. I don't want to turn this into a thing of gossip. I think the only knowledge you really need is they are under church discipline at Leonard. Don't need to go in and discuss, well, what they do? What does it turn into then? Does, does the church that I would go approach to use this in authority in one's life, do they need to know the sin? Do they? They don't need to know. What does it turn into if I decide to say, well, they were, uh, they were drunk, they, 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 they publicly go out and drink, and then they blaspheme Christ in the process. What has that turned into now? It's turned into a gossip, and am I uplifting my brother or sister in Christ that I am trying, through church discipline, to do what? Restore. But yet, I gossip with them about another pastor under... The umbrella of, well, I had to share with them that they're under church discipline. That's all I had to share, period. End of conversation. What sin? How does that benefit you? Just if you need to believe me as a pastor that them and our flock was put under church discipline and I would ask you to honor that. 
discussing it any further, turn you into gossip. So we see that disfellowship. I mean, we have so much more that we need to examine just so you guys can see it with your own eyes in 1 Corinthians. Ephesians chapter 6 addresses it. Um, we will see the perspective of exactly what Paul writes. And like I said, I, just, I do respect, and you're going to find this odd coming from me, but I, I, don't, I don't get the whole grasp of setting in the back pew. I, I, I don't know what that is. But, because to me, that's a, like a public shut or shaming or whatever else. But from the perspective of them caring enough as an individual that has been approached by the church of, if you come, you sit in the pew of shame, you are still willing to come and to worship and sit in that pew. What does that say about the individual? That they care enough to want their life to be pleasing to God and they know what they did and they're in agreement with the church in addressing it. And that's where a lot of things come into. A lot of people, well, the church shouldn't have that authority in my life. Unfortunately, there's lawsuits. There's lawsuits currently today that individuals sue local churches from a perspective of, you ruined my reputation. Well, what ruined the reputation? Gossip. Proper church discipline, the courts have upheld, and they say that's a separation, but what happens is people start gossiping about it, and then the authority of the church gets diminished, and hey, well, if that was a church discipline thing, why did all of Leonard know about it? When just the church members during the time of discipline at Leonard Community Church should have been the only people that knew. But gossip starts. So, any questions tonight in regards to, I mean, we, I, I threw a lot at you that we have to go back to Scripture and support, which we will. Um, like I said, all through, like Ephesians chapter, or Galatians chapter 6, not Ephesians chapter 6, that's obey your parents, or children obey your parents. But Galatians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we have Matthew chapter 18, that goes and supports, if we care about our relationship with God, we will give the authority of the church when we are in sin. And why does the church have that authority? Because they care. Not because they want to come and look at your life in a microscope. We're not talking, we're talking public sin. Any questions? Comments? Once, twice? Let's pray and